Now we'll hear from Dr. Michael Franken to talk a little bit about resolution care and rural health, right? It's, uh, it's, can you hear me? Let me move it a little closer. It is a thrill to be in a room with people that care about the things that I care about so much. Um, thank you for having me. Um, Um, before I start, I want to. I remember a conversation I had with uh, Diane uh, in an educational program she participated in where we talked about the shifting axis of uh, the universe of care. Um, that what we're experiencing now is uh, akin to a Copernican revolution, uh, where instead of uh, the Earth being uh, projected into the center of the universe, uh, it turns out uh, that uh, the people we care for. Um, are the sun and at the center of the universe. Um, in my universe, it's a binary system, a binary star system. Um, we place the people doing the care right there next to the people we care for. Um, I want you to listen as I talk uh, about, uh, for, for elements that relate to the comments earlier about the quadruple aim, um, about lifestyle issues, about recruitment and a deficient workforce, and listen for elements that seem to respond to that as I outline the model uh, that we have. So resolution care is a people-powered, technology-enabled, home-based palliative care initiative arising from the soil of where I live in very far northern California, Humboldt County. Um, and growing as a network, a network of that precious raw material that I refer to as network capacity for palliative care, that special, inspired, skillful, dedicated uh, group of precious, um, precious uh, professionals. Um, our mission is to bring capable and compassionate care to everybody, everywhere, uh, in the face of serious illness. Our model um, is not terribly unlike most of the community-based programs you've heard about. Um, what's fundamentally different is the sort of underlying foundation that I alluded to before. We're not a patient-centered organization. We're a person-centered organization that takes a sun and makes it into a binary star. Both the people we care for and the people doing the care are equally important to the sustainability, stability, and growth of our organization. Um, our interdisciplinary team consists of specially trained palliative care doctors, registered nurses, social workers, chaplains, um, and community health workers. Um, we've organized our structures as a somewhat flat um, and occasionally unwieldy uh, bunch of professionals. Um, there's not a top-down doctor-driven uh, hierarchy. Um, and in fact, the community health workers on the team bring a kind of a legacy of caregiving and wisdom as well as practical knowledge that uh, tends to lead quite often uh, clinical discussions and treatment planning for people. Um, Value-based payment is the wind in our sails. Um, without uh, an engaged and aligned relationship with healthcare financers, health plans, um, we don't have the room to be adaptive, responsive, resilient, able to manage the squeaky wheels as well as uh, choose to touch lightly uh, the people who wish or require a lighter touch. Um, um, yeah, I'll just keep it. So the folks we take care of are um, primarily rural. Um, our headquarters is in Humboldt County. Um, it's a service area that probably stretches uh, at least 150 miles to the east and north and south closer to 400, 450 miles. Uh, that's a lot of windshield time. Uh, it's a lot of people who live in uh, either rural or even remote settings. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we, we don't think so much about acuity. We think, so much, we, we think much more about what are the needs for the individuals um, on any given moment and what resources do we have to apply to meet those needs in adaptive nimble fashion. Um, 
the re reimbursement model, um, I have to say, um, I may be a little early, but I'm all in on value-based payment. It, it, it occurs to me that um, human behavior often is predictable on the basis of economics. Uh, so we have the healthcare system uh, that is a, a manifestation of a fee-for-service, productivity-driven, not capacity-building uh, structure. And um, I also happen to be delighted to live in California um, as it relates to the professionally. The state legislature, for those of you don't, that don't know, uh, passed in 2014 uh, SB 1004, which is essentially a mandate for palliative care to all Medicaid recipients in the state of California. The implementation of that has taken years longer than hoped or expected, but it will be fully implemented across the state um, by July of 2018, unless that can gets kicked down the road. Uh, luckier still is the partnership that we have with Partnership Health Plan. Um, they are a leader and innovator. They drank the Kool-Aid, and they are implementing an expansion of an SB 1004-like benefit uh, set of contracts uh, to uh, more than the four of us that participated in the pilot um, that proved the value. So um, for anybody that's interested, see me afterwards. I've got some copies of uh, the California Advanced Illness uh, Collaborative Consensus Standards that really defines the floor uh, for what community-based palliative care programs uh, should all look like. And uh, I think it's a very valuable resource. Yeah, and so we, we have a, a, a very uh, Medicaid-heavy population, and they are very high touch. Um, quite often, the clinical determinants of acuity um, really don't predict the amount of work that it takes to solve housing and food problems, uh, transportation problems, uh, behavioral health issues, as mentioned before. And it may be why the strength of our community health workers as a growing element of our model um, is really uh, delivering value inside. Uh, we also have a partner in the commercial insurance uh, market, uh, Blue Shield of California, as many of you know or should know, is a catalytic um, um, leader in value-based payment for uh, palliative care programs. Um, and I can't read that exactly, but I think I know what it says. It, 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 I, you know, until probably around November, maybe the first week of November last year, um, I thought it was uh, a fait accompli that CMS would come along um, with a value-based payment uh, standard across, um, across the country for palliative care. Um, I guess we'll just have to see how things go. Uh, we take care of people at home and we do it in one of two ways. Uh, one is we go to their house and we eat their cookies and we deal with their dog and uh, sit on their couch. Um, um, but a, a growing proportion of the care that we provide, we provide at a distance using video conferencing technology. Uh, some of the details that Dana shared are very common to what we do. We use our community health workers when necessary uh, to facilitate on the ground on the other end of the encounter. Uh, but we are uh, clear that it works beautifully. We also take care of people and meet them in coffee shops if that's what makes sense. We do essentially whatever makes sense. We take care of a proportion of our folks in nursing homes, uh, RCFEs or assisted living facilities. And because we uh, also have uh, a contract with our local community hospital, we're able to provide smooth and seamless continuity uh, for patients in our practice when they're hospitalized. So I'll tell you a little bit about telemedicine from my perspective. It's a kind of higher elevation view than, uh, than we heard from, from Dana, but it's the same story. Um, telemedicine 1.0 over the last 15 years was established in places like University of California, Davis, uh, Washington University in St. Louis. These were high uh, investment, high infrastructure projects, bricks and mortar buildings, big pipes of bandwidth and a hub-and-spoke model that uh, connected these tertiary care centers and their uh, subspecialty value to uh, rural clinic-based uh, telehealth centers. Um, and it worked. It delivered a lot of cognitive, heavy consultation support to primary care providers in rural uh, California and elsewhere. Um, but it couldn't scale because the barrier of entry is so 
high. Um, and then 10 years ago, telemedicine 2.0 came roaring in with all the smartphones in your pockets um, and cloud-based computing power. Um, and organizations have moved into that space, enterprises like Teladoc, American Well, um, uh, Doctors on Demand, et cetera, um, so that you can have a valuable encounter with a qualified uh, but essentially anonymous physician or provider for your sniffle or your sore throat or your ear pain. And that's good. 70 bucks, do it on your coffee break and you're back at your desk. That's big value to employers, it's big value to payers, and it saves people a lot of uh, more expensive um, care and urgent care in emergency room settings as well as um, long waits to get into their primary care. So that's good. That's a good thing. Um, enter us and what we think that we're doing is we're uh, pushing out on telemedicine 3.0, which is taking those very same off-the-shelf technologies and applying them to not transactional care, but relational care, longitudinal care, uh, care of people over time, relationship building through the window of a video conferencing platform. Um, I won't spend too much time with telemedicine 4.0, but some of you know that when you walk into a room and somebody's got uh, their son from Albuquerque on speakerphone and you had nothing to do with it, or like when I walked into a hospital inpatient consultation and a Native American family at the end of the bed had a laptop computer with five other family members from five other places in the country and I had nothing at all to do with it, Mr. Telehealth expert, had nothing to do with it. Um, either we lead or we follow, it's really up to us. That's what I talk about as telemedicine 4.0. So in our practice, 20% uh, or more of our folks are using it as their primary channel for engagement with, um, with the healthcare team. Um, there are many barriers of use, some of which you can imagine. Uh, the availability of technology and, uh, and connectivity is sometimes a barrier, often easily overcome. Um, and sometimes overcome simply inside of a value-based payment model, we can make that expenditure. We can loan them a tablet. We can get a satellite dish on the top of their house. All of that, if it delivers on real value, quality of their lives and satisfaction, ultimately we recognize if we pay attention to that stuff, the costs go down. Um, Um, simply in terms of satisfaction, people really like to use these technologies. They appreciate instantaneously their value. The technology itself, because the platform we use is effective um, and fairly seamless, uh, the technology disappears. Uh, so when we ask people, um, 9 out of 10 of them say things like, uh, it takes the delay out. It's fairly responsive and adaptive. We can slide in an acute encounter in minutes for people um, and deal with whatever is on their plate at that particular moment. Uh, all of the obvious difficulties of getting up, getting showered, schlepping out of your bed, getting your daughter to take a half a day off from work, getting to the uh, the uh, waiting room to look at 10-year-old People magazines and having that clipboard shoved in your face again. All that stuff goes away, as well as the windshield time, transportation costs, paying for gas and maintenance for your staff. All of that stuff tends to go away the more you utilize these technologies. And most of our folks had no concerns. A few of our folks can't stand doing it and won't. That's OK. As long as they live in relatively close, we're able to adapt to their preferences that, that way. Um, and so we enjoy um, the kind of satisfaction that the only other place in healthcare you can find is in hospice. 95 plus percent satisfaction. Um, it's extraordinary. We also enjoy um, measurable improvements in symptom scores. And ultimately, we have well uh, outperformed the uh, uh, expectations of our clinical pilot with Partnership Health Plan, um, the whole Medi-Cal uh, managed care 
goal for SB 1004 is to make community-based palliative care cost neutral. We've done that. Uh, and we've uh, really knocked the ball out of the park. Um, our future is really about this thing, this, this creation of network capacity or building networks of care, gathering together this incredible resource of inspired, supported, and sustainable palliative care teams, and then working with partnerships to direct that value towards solving specific kinds of problems. Um, examples include small hospitals, critical access hospitals that have no ability to invest in the development of a robust or complete palliative care team. Uh, we can lower the barrier of entry and do work for inpatient palliative care consultations for hospitals with 25 beds. Um, we can uh, we understand from uh, data from the state of California that less than 25% of palliative care teams in the community are actually fully resourced. Um, there are a lot of burned out docs out there. Um, and um, by wrapping around our model of care, we can enhance their ability uh, to um, sustain themselves. Challenges um, are the same, as Eric noted as well, is uh, can we provide a workforce opportunity uh, that appeals to uh, the current and future um, healthcare professional uh, expectations? Uh, can we do that? I think we can. Um, can we sustain and build a remote workforce culture that gives people the freedom to work where they want to um, but also to feel part of something and integrated into teams of care. Um, we think we can do that. Um, we're working on issues of referral development that Dana alluded to, where uh, they don't wait for doctors to make those referrals. They make contact and then offer that service or explain to the uh, centrally treating oncologist or other providers that they're going to do it. We dream of an integrated platform where everything happens in one information ecosphere. Dream with me, please. Um, and in a community-based program, particularly in a rural program, we're challenged by uh, our lack of ability to be selective. Anybody that comes our way, self-referred or otherwise, that meet the criteria for the kind of care we provide, we can't say no, regardless of their payer mix. And so that's a real weakness of our business model. As we grow into network applications, we'll have more control over the populations. We need. So our policy, policy wishes are for, uh, just like SB 1004 in California, we wish for a Medicare-mandated national value-based payment benefit for community-based palliative care at home. It's in everybody's best interest. Um, we hope for uh, telemedicine parity, um, and we hope to be able to demonstrate our ability to give even better than real care um, with our model. Um, and uh, because the geographies start to fall away as relevant, uh, we hope for national licensure and uh, reciprocity across state lines. So you can wish that with me. Thank you.